Hello, we're going to be talking about how modern day CPUs are similar in some ways, but different in lots of ways to the sort of historical models we learn about when we are in computer science lessons. So here are some of the very earliest computers from the 1940s. In some ways, these are quite similar to modern CPUs because they have the same rough units, the same architecture in terms of memory, the same use of buses and registers, and the same fetch, the code execute cycle. But in lots of ways, one day CPUs are different. That's understatement of a century because they have loads of different features which aim to increase performance and allow them to work at a level which would be frightening to somebody from even the 1970s, 1980s. So here are two modern day CPUs. The word contemporary in this context means the same as modern. So if you are asked about contemporary processors, it means modern day processors, which all the things you've learned about do apply to modern processors, right? We can look at two modern ones here and see the same stats we've been learning about, clock speed, number of cores, cache size. The number of cores and cache size are two examples of where modern day CPUs deviate from the earliest CPU architectures. The early architectures, they weren't thinking about having multiple cores and cache came in relatively quickly, but wasn't an immediate invention. People came up with cache in order to try and extract performance even further. So if you are asked about how modern day CPUs are different to historical ones, well, having cores, having cache are definitely examples. A point you can make related to clock speed is the fact that most CPUs nowadays allow you to increase the clock speed in order to improve performance further. You can see this i7 here in particular is advertised as being unlocked. That means you were able to, via the motherboard or via the BIOS, increase the clock speed so that it works at a faster rate. That flexibility wasn't available in the earliest CPUs. And all modern day CPUs use pipelining, which is a process to improve efficiency. Older CPUs just didn't have that feature. So you could be asked to compare and contrast a little bit here. They won't ask you about specifics because there are so many things you could be learning about. But I want to give you some examples which you can use if you are asked about contemporary versus historical CPUs. So one of the things which modern day CPUs have are more components than we teach you about in this topic. So we've learned that the ALU is used to execute instructions. In reality, there'll be multiple other components as well, which can also be used to execute instructions. And ALU is typically our generic component, which does most general tasks, but having specialist other units means they are able to execute those specialist instructions faster than the generic circuit. So FPU might be a floating point unit. This is specialized for floating point maths, which is a little bit more complicated and slower than integer based maths. And an MPU are becoming more and more common. That is a neural processing unit specialized for AI related processing, which again could be done by an LU, but will be faster with these specialized circuits. And we'll talk about graphics cards in a few videos time, but ironically, the cheaper CPUs tend to have integrated graphics to support the CPU being able to execute graphic related tasks. More expensive CPUs don't have this because they will expect you to buy a fancier and more powerful graphics card. Now, another nice term to drop into any answers is the term superscalar processing, because most CPUs nowadays use this. Even in the last 15 years, some processors didn't use superscalar processing, for example, mobile phones, but nowadays pretty much every CPU will use this. This is a little bit similar to pipelining where we have aspects of simultaneous execution within a single core. So even within one core, we are able to have multiple different execution units working on different instructions at the same time. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's say we are currently in the execute stage and let's say we're doing some floating point maths in our FPU. Well, that leaves the ALU, MPU, and integrated graphics left idle, which is not good. We don't want stuff to be left idle, that is inefficient. So instead of leaving those other units idle, let's give them an instruction to work on. So that all four are always working. And one way of plugging these gaps, so to speak, is by utilizing out of order execution. This is where the CPU will look in its pipeline and move instructions higher in the pipeline if it's got time to execute these. And this could be because one of those units like the ALU or NPU is left free. And so it could be working on that instruction, but it also could be because another instruction is stalled, meaning it's waiting for something else to happen. If that's the case, we may as well use this time to execute another instruction ahead of schedule. So we're kind of deviating from the program order 
and we're doing our own order because we're trying to maximize our resources. Now, an instruction could be stored because we're waiting for memory, for example. Memory is the bane of the existence of a CPU because memory is so much slower than the CPU. If we're waiting for memory to do something, we may as well execute a different instruction, even if it means going out of order and then having to reverse the order when it is finished. Why do we do this? Well, it reduces time wasted where we are sat waiting in bottlenecks. Another thing CPUs do really quite well is speculation, which is where it predicts what branching instructions are going to do. In the pipelining video, we talked about how we have an issue where pipeline can be broken by branching. Well, if we've got quite a long pipeline, a CPU might have 30 instructions currently in a pipeline. If we reach a branching instruction, this might result in us having to jump back up and execute something else, which completely breaks that pipeline. It will cause it to get flushed. That is another way of saying discard it. So we might have to discard 30 steps worth of work if we have a branching instruction. So therefore, the CPU will try and predict what the outcome is going to be of a branching instruction based on previous code and based on previous experiences. So the control unit will notice, oh, there's a branching command coming up in 20 instructions. Let's think about what's happened in the past. What do you think is the most likely outcome going to be of this branch? Will it continue to go ahead, which is fine, or will it branch back up? Will we have to load in other instructions? And based on this prediction, it will be bold and execute the pipeline it thinks is going to happen, which seems quite risky. It can seem a bit like you're guessing what's going to happen, but actually a lot of programs are quite predictable. A loop, for example, this one here will just count down. If I type in five, it will count down five, four, three, two, one. Well, that's quite predictable. It can learn that pattern and apply that in its speculation so that actually most CPUs get this right up to 95% of the time or something like that. Now also all the stuff I've looked at so far obviously does benefit CPUs. CPUs would not be doing all this work if it didn't actually improve performance, but there is a downside to doing all of this in that it takes up more scheduling time. The control unit has got a harder job to do to manage this process and make these predictions and look ahead and try and decide what needs to get executed. This takes more work. This is called an overhead and takes up more power and requires more complicated circuitry. That being said, clearly all of this does make a difference. Just to give you another couple of things to know about. So we typically in computers follow the von Neumann architecture, where we've got one memory unit for both instructions and data. Von Neumann has an issue in that it has a bottleneck where you can't access data and instructions at the same time. Whereas the Harvard model, you've got two separate memories and that means we can access them simultaneously. Now, Modern day CPUs have had to basically follow the von Neumann architecture because RAM will contain both instructions and data, but within the CPU, they're free to use Harvard if they want to. So often cache is organized a bit more like the Harvard model, in which case it will have one cache for instructions and one separate cache unit for data. And this is almost always true for level one cache. Level two cache, level three cache may not be Harvard, maybe more like von Neumann, but for level one cache, which needs the highest speed, we might have separate caches. It's more expensive and more complicated, but it means we don't have bottlenecks where we can't access both simultaneously. A final quite cool sounding but confusing concept is simultaneous multi-threading. You might have seen on your computer, it might say, oh, you've got eight cores, but we've got 16 threads. Well, what does that mean? Well, a thread is really a, a fake core. Often a core, can have two threads, maybe more in some CPUs, but generally it will be two threads. Now, this technique allows the operating system to allocate multiple processors to a core at the same time. In other words, it makes it seem like there are more cores than there actually physically are. Like I said, it's often two threads a core. So from the perspective of the operating system, it behaves like it is able to do two instructions simultaneously, which we know isn't quite true. It can't literally do two at the same time. However, it can exploit things like stools in your pipeline and superscalar processing to make it seem like it is doing two instructions at once, whereas in reality it is not. But there is enough wiggle room that pretty much it behaves like it's doing two in one go. Now modern CPUs do all of the things we've talked about and more to try and extract as much performance. All of these things we've covered deviate from what you are typically told, but it's important for you to understand roughly how modern CPUs work and ultimately you could be asked about this in the exam.